Around four in five adults, so that's around 80% of us, experience lower back pain at some stage in our lives. It's the most common cause of job-related disability and it's the leading contributor to missed work days. For many of us, the symptom is short-lived and with lifestyle changes such as losing weight, staying active and with physio support and advice about better posture and safer lifting techniques in combination with over-the-counter painkillers, most people soon return back to normal activities. If the pain persists after six weeks, this is the time that it would be beneficial to see a pain specialist. Once an individual has experienced pain for longer than 12 weeks, the issue becomes a chronic pain one. So it's important that the investigations are undertaken between the six and 12 week period to prevent an acute pain becoming chronic. Chronic back pain is defined as pain that continues for 12 weeks or longer and even after that initial injury or underlying cause of acute back pain has been treated. Around 20% of people affected by acute lower back pain develop chronic lower back pain. Neck pain is another common complaint. Two in five adults experience this symptom and similar to back pain, it often goes away after a couple of weeks and is usually caused by poor posture like being hunched over a computer for a long period of time or sleeping in an uncomfortable position. This can usually be managed with exercises to stretch the muscles in the neck, massage or over-the-counter painkillers such as paracetamol. Neck pain becomes more of a concern when it's accompanied by symptoms such as headaches, numbness, weakness or tingling in the arms and legs. Rarely it is a sign of something serious. It can be due to nerve compression, where the nerves are being pinched by bone spurs from the vertebrae, worn joints such as those associated with osteoarthritis, or delayed pain from an injury such as whiplash injury sustained most commonly in road traffic accidents. Back pain can occur for a variety of reasons, and the underlying injury and cause of the pain are multiple herniated discs, muscle strain from overuse or poor postures as mentioned before, muscle injury, pinched compressed nerves, narrowing of the spinal canal, vertebral fractures, osteoporosis, natural processes of aging, spondylitis which is a, a spinal infection that creates inflammation, scoliosis, tumours, degenerative disc disease, these are some of the conditions that may be diagnosed and often referred to as back pain, but they have these underlying injuries that cause the back pain. And these can impact your walking ability, standing for long periods of time, your ability to work, particularly for those who have very physical jobs. The impact of chronic pain in particular has a significant impact on a person's energy levels and mood and can be a cause of poor and unrefreshing sleep. There are multiple factors that impact your susceptibility to sustaining back pain. Age is a massive one. The first attack most people experience of lower back pain typically occurs between the ages of 30 and 50. And back pain becomes more common with advancing age. Loss of bone strength from osteoporosis can lead to fractures and at the same time muscle elasticity and tone decrease. The invertebral discs begin to lose fluid and flexibility with age and this decreases their ability to cushion the vertebrae. Fitness levels is a big one. Back pain is more common among people who are not physically fit. Weak back and abdominal muscles may not properly support the spine. The term weekend warriors is used to refer to people who go out and exercise intensely and a lot after being inactive all week. And these people are more likely to suffer painful back injuries. People who uh, make moderate physical activity a daily habit are less likely to do so. Studies shown that low impact aerobic exercise such as walking can help maintain the integrity of invertebral discs. Being overweight, obese or quickly gaining a significant amount of weight can put stress on the back and lead to lower back pain. Sometimes it's genetics, some causes of back pain such as ankylosing spondylitis which is a form of arthritis that involves fusion of the spinal joints leading to some immobility of the spine have a genetic component. Job related factors, huge one. Having a job that requires heavy lifting, pushing, pulling, particularly when it involves twisting or vibrating your spine, can lead to injury and back pain. 
Working at a desk all day also contributes to back pain, especially from poor posture or sitting in a chair with not enough back support. Your mental health is a factor as well. Your anxiety and depression can influence how closely we focus on pain, as well as our perception of its severity. Pain that becomes chronic also can contribute to the development of such psychological factors. Stress can affect the body in numerous ways, including causing muscle tension and therefore more back pain. If you're a smoker, you are more at risk because it restricts the blood flow and oxygen to the discs, causing them to degenerate faster. And don't underestimate psychological factors, your mood, depression, stress, and your psychological well-being also are a massive influence on the likelihood of you experiencing back pain. It's a known fact that women are more likely to experience neck and back pain more than men. Chronic back pain is most often treated with a stepped care approach, moving from simple, low-cost, non-invasive treatments to more aggressive approaches. Specific treatments may depend on the identified cause of the back pain. So first-line treatments usually involve painkillers, anti-inflammatory medications, opioid medications, antidepressants, and in some cases, anticonvulsants in the treatment sciatica. As before, I mentioned exercise, physio um, techniques on better posture, better sleep, better lifting uh, techniques. Stage two of treatments often involve behavioral therapies such as CBT, which uh, involve focusing on relaxation techniques to ease the back pain. Another really common, quite effective um, treatment is often used as spinal injections. So there are things like trigger point injections that can relax knotted muscles that contribute to the back pain. So an injection or a series of injections of local anesthetic or often corticosteroid drugs uh, are injected into the trigger point and this can lessen or relieve pain. There's epidural steroid injections into the lumbar area or the lower area of the back and these are given to treat lower back pain and sciatica associated with inflammation. Pain relief associated with the injections tends to be temporary and the injections are not advised for long-term use. Radiofrequency ablation involves inserting a fine needle into the area causing the pain through which an electrode is passed and heated to destroy the nerve fibres that carry the pain signals to the brain. This procedure can relieve pain for several months. For particularly severe spinal conditions that, can, that can't be treated by non-invasive means, there are numbers of surgical options that can be employed. When it comes to cannabis medicines, we found that cannabis medicines are useful in the management of back and neck pain as they can help relax the muscles and reduce inflammation. They're also very effective in the management of nerve pain for people experiencing pain as a result of compressed nerves, for example. In the case of back pain in particular, it is important to continue to explore investigations and interventions such as injections or surgery in more severe cases, as although cannabis medicines are an effective pain management tool, there is a risk that the underlying cause of the pain can continue to deteriorate, even though the medication would cause you to experience less pain. The clinical team at Integra will always support our patients to do this.